Well, hello, this is uh, Chase Swift, and I'm really glad you're here. Uh, you most likely have done a search on Google or maybe YouTube for how to be a wildlife photographer. And in this video, I'm going to share exactly what I've done to become a wildlife photographer. And as you can see, I got photographs hanging in my living room here, uh, some great wildlife and nature and landscapes and all that great stuff. I've been a photographer since uh, the early to mid 80s. So it's uh, about 25 years. Uh, it's been awesome, but uh, it's not for everybody. Um, not because I'm not saying you shouldn't do it, but because there are some challenges, expenses, and uh, a lot of learning. It's just like any other career or profession you have to, um, to be the best, you got to work at it, okay? So uh, I want to share some photos just so you get a sense of what type of photographer I am, um, the, some of the wildlife that I photographed, and I'll be able to share a little bit of information about these photos, give some tips, give some pointers on why they might be a good photograph so that can help you become a good or excellent wildlife photographer. And then at the end, I'll give you some really good tips that you'll want to take action on that will help you as well. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And I have a uh, iPhoto uh, slideshow I want to show you. And I'm just going to go through these slides. Uh, so, you know, just kind of touch on a few of these, but the key is sometimes close and colorful and just well composed. And here's a great close up. I mean, now this is not a wild animal. So to be a wildlife photographer does not mean you always have to shoot 100% wild animals. They can be captive or in controlled situations so that you can get good photographs of them. There's nothing wrong with that. If you, if you really are concerned, you'll want to caption your photos as in controlled uh, environment, okay? But uh, you can get some great photos. Um, this is a set of images that a photographer, a uh, friend of mine, and myself went and uh, collaborated on. We provided this as a package. Uh, they were royalty-free images, so that means uh, you can buy the images and use them however you like. So this is a set of those images, and we, we it's called Life in the Wild. Uh, that was the name of the CD or the disc. And uh, boy, this is just a phenomenal image, by the way. Um, so these are images that over the years that took us, Jeff and I, uh, Jeff Anuga and I, to shoot and photograph it. It's it's a years and years and years of collecting these and photographing these wonderful animals and beautiful settings. And this one in particular is in a controlled situation. You're not going to just happen to come across a, a fox that's looking you in the you know in the in the lens of the camera, looking right at you or near with some beautiful flowers. So this is a controlled situation. Nothing wrong with that. In fact, if you're going to make money as a wildlife photographer, you need to not have the fox running away from you and you get the tail end of him as he jumps through the bushes. Okay. No, you need pleasing uh, images. And there are places and in, in situations on how to do these uh, types of photographs where you basically are renting the scene or the renting the animal to photograph. And it seems weird to rent an animal, but you're you're actually going to a place where you can photograph animals in a very controlled, safe condition, safe for the animals, safe for you. Okay, that's important. Um, here's a badger. So you you need to, to know uh, good places to photograph. And I'll have some details on where to do this. Uh, endangered species. This is a black-footed ferret. Very endangered. So. If the, if the situation ever presents itself, that you can uh, put yourself in a position to photograph in a nice and pleasing way an endangered species, it's, it's very, very powerful because you have most likely an image that's hard to get. Okay, so black-footed ferrets, very difficult to photograph. And uh, Jeff was able to work with uh, some state agencies and government agencies 
to photograph a, a, a black ferret that was not captive, but it was in a controlled situation, I believe. So, but other times you're able to <laughs> photograph like a prairie dog and, uh, and do it in a nice way. Notice, you know, cons the background or uh, the focus on the, on the animal in the eye, the glint in the eye, and keeping your backgrounds non-distracting. Do you notice that this is a non-distracting background? It just fades out into a blurry background, so that's, that's very helpful. Um, <clears throat> I have to say, though, this is another situation where it's a controlled situation where you can photograph an animal in a controlled situation. And this was uh, a, a captive raccoon that was placed in a situation where he would regularly poke his head out of his tree trunk. Now, I know I'm giving away some like, oh my gosh, you're giving away the secrets. Well, the, the honest truth is you need to create images today if you want to eat tomorrow, right? So uh, I'm telling you that sometimes you need to shorten the amount of time that takes to get beautiful images. So using in a controlled situation, and there are many ways to do that. Maybe you know someone that has uh, animals that are looking great and in a, con in a controlled situation, it's awesome. It's, it's wonderful. It's a way to do it, okay? Uh, this is also a controlled situation, so uh, you just don't see a river otter running down the riverbank right by you. It's kind of rare. So does that mean that this photograph is fake? No. It means it was in a controlled situation. It's very difficult to get this. I mean, you notice it's in sharp focus. You've got the glint of the eye. The background is fading off into kind of a blur. It's nice action. It shows... You know, how many times have you seen a river otter running down a riverbank? It's it's pretty unique, and that's what you need. You need uniqueness to your images. Okay, rattlesnake, definitely controlled situation, definitely, okay? And certainly this, now this would have been in a zoo where you can photograph through glass, okay, with a flash, and you, you can learn how to do that. It's not difficult, but how else are you going to get a, a close-up of a rattlesnake? without getting bitten, that's uh, a concern. So you wanna be safe. I wanna emphasize, be safe at all times, okay? What a beautiful, in a way, it is a beautiful you know, reptile, you know, the snakes and how intricate they are, but you wanna keep yourself safe. Um, there's another controlled situation, a red-eyed tree frog. In kind of like a, well, it was in my kitchen, <laughs> but I had, I made it look like a studio. So the lesson here is learn how to create the best photograph you can. If the background is not great, eliminate it. Uh, if you can, in this situation, as I did, I used uh, a strobe up on top uh, above the frog and then a white reflector uh, underneath so it didn't create huge, harsh shadows. So you'll learn these things. You can learn these things about photographing uh, animals and, and any subject. But in this situation, the background, my kitchen would have been terrible, okay? So you've got to obviously take what you got. So I had a red-eyed tree frog with this, this beautiful color. So I just said, you know what? I'll, I'll just make sure that uh, I'll, I'll make it as though it was taken at night, which... You can do it in the middle of the day, which is fantastic, okay? Now, this was kind of fun. And then this is a leopard uh, frog. And he was photographed in my kitchen again, okay? Are you really going to go out and step around in the pond and try to sneak up on a wild frog and hope that he stays there still while you set up your tripod and take a bunch of different shots? As you can see, it's kind of hard to predict that or to get that done. So a lot of times you can, well, to be a good and um, a, a wildlife photographer that can earn money today, you don't want to be traipsing around ponds. Not that that's a bad thing, but it just takes too long to get really good photographs if you are completely a purist 
and you're like, nope, I'm just going to photograph things in the wild. That's fine. And I applaud you for that attitude. That's wonderful. But it just makes getting really good marketable images. It just takes longer, much longer. Okay. So here, let me give you a secret. This is a, uh, I think I bought some, uh, you know, a baking, a cookie sheet and I, I sprayed it with uh, spray paint black. And so what does it look like? It looks black or dark. It looks like a dark pond. I filled it with uh, maybe an inch of water, um, not a whole lot of water. And what does the water do? It actually allows it to be kind of like a, well, you can see that the frog is in water, number one. But number two is just, uh, it adds a little bit of reflection and it looks like he's sitting in a little pond. And then I had a strobe, which is a flash, and in this, it, with a, with a uh, what's called a soft box. So it, it's not a harsh direct uh, strobe, it's very soft lighting. If you look at the eye of the frog, and I can uh, maybe even zoom in a little bit here. Okay, if you zoom in on this frog, you can see the um, the softness of the lights. That is a that's a big square rectangular softbox right in there. Okay, but it provides very soft, beautiful lighting. the The colors are accentuated. So in this situation, you you sometimes need to learn how to best photograph a a subject and to make it look the best. And so that's just some secrets that I used that you can use. Uh, and and yeah, the frog jumped around quite a few times and made a little bit of a mess here and there, but we we were kind and gentle to him. Uh, and it was actually a, a pet leopard frog. Okay, so he would turn, return him back to his aquarium. He was fed very well. He was taken very good care of. But we used this situation, just photographing in a kitchen, uh, and my lens was just focused in with the background on the cookie sheet that was painted black. Very simple, but a very compelling image of a leopard frog, okay? Now, this is a Wyoming toad, as I recall. It's rare, and it's in the wild. So notice the pinpoint. I'm just talking about lighting here. As we look at the pinpoint of the flash, it's very distinct. It's a round little dot. Well, that's because it's a direct flash. And you'll notice the shadows are harsher than it would be if it was a big softbox. So just a difference. I'm not saying one is really better, but if you can, if you can control the situation, obviously try to make it as best possible. Uh, this is a great shot. It's of a, it's an of a uh, not an endangered species, but a threatened species. So, a good thing to photograph for certain. Okay, American uh, crocodile or alligator. I'm sorry, and uh, wonderful. So long lens. Keep keep your distance. Don't get too close. Okay, uh, tortoises. Awesome. Notice the perspective. It's not standing up, uh, looking down. It's lying down looking eye to eye. So I, if you'll notice all these animals are generally, I'm at their eye level or lower. And it just is a, a great perspective to keep your eye level at their eye level. So sometimes get lower and be at their eye level rather than being above or too far below, okay? Uh, beautiful uh, elk and deer, beautiful lighting. That just takes a lot of time and effort to get now you can't you can't do much with an elk they're going to look they're going to do the things that they are going to do you can't really tell them what to do you can't you know <laughs> force them so you got to be ready and you got to have your lens quick and ready to focus autofocus is great these days but when something happens you've got to be ready you've just got to be ready okay so look at your backgrounds Try to keep the uh, background as pleasing and out of focus as possible. That's using a wide or wide open f-stop on your lens so that the background naturally blurs out. And uh, Jeff and I shoot a lot of cover, vertical images, uh, covers for books and magazines. So think 
how are they going to use this image? Well, they're going to produce maybe a cover or a magazine or a book. So they need a good vertical that is pleasing all the way through that makes everything look good. Okay. So action, get ready. It, it happens quicker than you think. You've got to be ready. Uh, a shot like this, you have a lot more time to set up and compose and look at the background and check the lighting and check your photos, focus. So sometimes you have a, a lot more time than you think, uh, which is a luxury, which is nice. But certain animals will look and boom, that, I mean, you get them both, the glint in the eye, there's some interest there. It's an awesome, it's a, it's a really good shot, okay? It's a nice shot. And uh, yeah, just keep working at it. And this took a lot of work. Uh, it's the middle of January when the animal looks their best in winter. Okay, these mountain goats look very shaggy and raggedy in the winter, in the summer, okay? The winter, they are beautiful. Took a major hike in the middle of January. It was rather chilly, rather cold, I should say, but it was worth it, okay? So sometimes you need to do what other people aren't going to do, okay? Moose, moose and, uh, the fall in their rut, beautiful animals. Uh, be careful though, keep your distance. They are very wild animals, so are bison. There are more people injured by bison than you realize. They are not slow and dumb, <laughs> okay? But when you have the chance, look at the background, look at the lighting, try to get to catch light in the eye, okay? It's fantastic. And is this not just a fantastic shot of, the, you know, what the old herds of the bison used to be, okay? Awesome stuff. Again, wait for the moment when you know, when you see something happening that's just fantastic, okay? Both big rams looking, same direction, you know, that's when you're shooting like crazy, all right? Here, a little more time to set up. Choose your background. Uh, you know, the animal is not dead center. In the um, view in the viewfinder of the frame, it's placed off cent. You could call it a rule of thirds. So the interest of the ram's head is in the lower left third. Okay, it just adds some negative space. When I say negative space, over here uh, where you see my mouse moving, uh, a book publisher, a calendar, a magazine, they can type. You know how to photograph the wild rams of Wyoming. Okay, they, they sometimes will put what's called a tagline or a uh, information in text on the, on the side. So you need to not always photograph the animal right in the center, okay? Just use some good composition. Again, verticals are used a lot for covers, okay? And isn't that just, it's a very unique view. You have to say, you know what? I wonder what it would look like if I walked behind the animal and I saw these deep blue mountains way away and you would envision that they would be out of focus and you just, you get a beautiful color, you get beautiful interest in it and a unique uh, perspective, a unique photograph. So when everyone's, if you're like in a national park and everyone's in one spot, now be careful, but Try to investigate without disrupting the behavior of the animal. Try to see if there's another view because you cannot uh, be unique if you're photographing the same thing everyone else is photographing, okay? Now, wild animal in the wild? No, not at all. It's a uh, wild animal for sure in a controlled situation. And when it snarls, you better be ready because they don't do it on command. They just do it when they're <laughs> when they're snarling. So you know you have to be ready and on and and when it happens, you don't get a second chance. Now in a zoo, as this shot was, doesn't look. You know it might look like a zoo to you. Maybe not. I don't know. But it has a sense that you can get close, closer to the animals. If you blur out your background, you can get some nice shots at a zoo. So I do visit zoos and it's very good to do but this is not a zoo okay uh, a wild animal in a captive or controlled situation not easy to do but it is possible okay 
Beautiful stuff. Action is awesome. Okay. And when they just look at you and you see the glint of their eyes, boy, that's the time to be shooting. Now, a cheetah is known for speed. So a cheetah laying in the bushes, great, good. But running is fantastic because that's what they're known for. They are the fastest animal on the earth. They can run at speeds of 70 miles an hour. So try the best as you can. It's a hard one. Trust me, it's hard to get a running cheetah, okay? <clears throat> uh, more close up to a mountain lion or cougar. Uh, a very controlled situation, okay? The same thing here in a, in a winter scene. Notice the background is blurry, but it adds that mountain feel. But the focus is on the animal. Okay, this is another zoo situation. It doesn't look like it. I was able to isolate a lion that was on this rock, you know, and the background looked very wild. So you can do very well. You have to spend time at the zoo and wait for that moment to happen, but you can do it. And yawning, any activity like that is just, it adds that element of interest to your photograph, okay? African lion, yes, this is not wild or out in the wild, but it is a wild animal. But it's actually more a captive trained or they're used to humans. Okay. Now, there is nothing like I love this photograph uh, because it's the it shows the beauty of a, a male African lion. Now, a male African lion in Africa is all scarred up. He's battled. And he's fought. He has flies in his eyes. So sometimes the uh, Hollywood version of a lion is very different than the real life lion in the wild. So both are good photographs. I'm not saying one is better than the other, but this is actually quite beautiful of this intimate portrait of a lion. Of course, running, fantastic. On the prowl, fantastic. And anytime you get an unusual look, shoot and uh, keep shooting, okay? Bears also very uh, unpredictable, very dangerous, of course. So this is in a uh, controlled situation, okay? This, however, is not. This is in the wild of uh, Alaska, okay? So be, be cautious, be careful, know what you're doing, or go with someone that knows what they're talking about. Now, this is photographed from a platform in Katmai National Park. Very safe, uh, very, you're able to get very close to bears in the wild. This is a wild bear in the river, as wild as you can get, but we were able to be quite safe, quite close, okay? Polar bears, very dangerous, of course. So you have to photograph them from uh, buggies that are much, you know, very tall and all that. So, but then with a longer lens, look at the detail of uh, the paws and how, how cool that is in their fur. And so don't pass up details, okay? Obviously beautiful, wonderful light, uh, great exposure, uh, good composition. Uh, maybe it's lacking a little bit of action, but it's not too bad, is it? Obviously a little bit better with two of them. There's more interest, good composition. Um, you know, I would play with that, you know, try different uh, compositions of the animals. Obviously a very contemplative moment, uh, very nicely done. You can't argue with that. It's well exposed, good sharp focus, all that good stuff. Now fighting, can't beat it. There's action, there's interest. Uh, so it makes sense to have a vertical. And, uh, you know, I don't even know, but way off in the distance, those look like uh, houses, but they're blurred out. Okay. So, whoops. Let's, uh, what did I do? Let's go back. <laughs> I clicked on something I didn't want to. So, let's go right back. A capuchin monkey in a captive environment, a baboon in a captive environment, wild horses in the wild. Okay. Jeff is a master at this and uh, was able to photograph. BLM uh, roundups, and you can't get much better than that. I mean, that's that's the real deal right there, okay? So sometimes you can't work in a captive environment. You've got to do the best you can. You've got to anticipate and hope that you're in the right position 
and shoot, shoot, shoot. You know, anticipate that they might come along a ridge where you got blue sky in the background or a, a pleasing background. And then Jeff is also uh, able to photograph uh, wild uh, stallions rearing. This is not something you can just, uh, you know, hope for, but you got to be ready when it happens. And it happens fast. Very fortunate, very uh, dedicated to getting that image. And after years of doing this, he's able to do that. Okay. When things aren't quite you know, what you want, you can experiment with some shutter speeds and when they're running and add some emotion, some art to your images. Okay, so that's a very good uh, idea. In a zoo, okay, owls at night, close-ups. Very hard to do in the wild. In a zoo, you can do that. With a uh, flash, now you'll notice, again, similar to our other one, the flash is very small and it's got this bright reflection. That's going to create uh, a harsh, direct light with shadows up on the right-hand side that are just go jet black. So that's okay. That's what you would expect to some degree of an owl, you know, a photograph of an owl. There's just, it's not a studio situation. So in a zoo, you can do that, okay? Now, this is different. This is completely different. An owl that I was able to photograph, it's actually a, a raptor uh, at a raptor rehab center, and he had been injured. So he was not able to fly, and he was uh, very easy to put be put into a situation where I could photograph him. You notice right here I'm using what's called a diffusion flat as a reflector. It's a big white sheet someone was helping hold. And that provides a little bit of fill into the uh, shadows so you can see. And the shadows aren't deep and black, but that helps. And you'll, you can see the reflector right there. Now, for the most part, you're not zoomed in that much. You don't see it until you realize, oh, my gosh, what a beautiful lighting where it just it looks just nice. Okay. So I've learned how to control the light when the situation presents itself in a controlled situation like I was here, okay? Good old zoo, some nice play on color and shape and form. Very simple to do at a zoo, okay? Again at a zoo, okay, very nice. Again at a zoo, very unique perspective of a turkey vulture. You wouldn't get this close, probably, in, in the wild. They're, they're a little more uh, cautious. Okay. Bats. Where are you going to find bats? Well, sometimes I guess you could find them in the wild, but this was at a zoo just because it was a lot easier to find them because I knew they were there. Okay. One strobe, one flash, not on my camera, but held off to the side. And as I zoom in here, there's the telltale sharp point of the flash and then the other telltale is the harsh black shadows but it's a bat at night what do you expect okay and i've been able to use a bunch more equipment but not in a zoo you can't really get away with that okay so you do what you can uh in the wild of a nesting um uh, mountain bluebird beautiful just beautiful Turkeys, uh, that's a whole nother thing. Uh, you know, they're very wary, but sometimes you get lucky. A lot of times, and I should say, you'll, you'll be in a blind, okay? You may actually resort to what hunters do and put yourself in a blind where you can photograph kind of, you know, uh, unobstructed or covered up from the view of the animals, okay? Pheasants, very challenging, uh, but this is a wild one in the wild, so... Uh, you just out, you're out there long enough, and you're going to get great photos. Uh, Bosque del Apache in New Mexico, huge flocks of snow geese. Play with the shutter speed. Sure, you can get the nice sharp shot, but a little more sense of uh, motion and art, color, shape, blur. It just gives a sense that there's a lot of motion, a lot of birds, and it, you just want to look and keep looking at all the interesting detail. Uh, you know, or the blur, or the shape, or the form. So, see what I mean here? This is 
probably less uh, interesting, but it does show numbers. Uh, it's a great habitat shot. So, you know, everything is good. Uh, you just have to keep doing good form, good exposure, good composition, all that good stuff. Uh, you, you got my, one of my favorite uh, subjects, the bald eagle, and uh, a lot of these will be found in captive or controlled situations, but sometimes you will have the chance to photograph them wild, okay? This is Homer, Alaska, Fa fabulous. The eagles, they're just thick, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's a place to go. And you can really work hard to get some great images that are not easy. This takes a long time. Okay, but what a beautiful and majestic bird for certain. And hopefully you'll get something unique like this that you can't predict, but you just keep doing the best you can. And autofocus is huge at this point. And for, thankfully, we have a lot of cameras that have autofocus that does that. Okay. Now, you can't get better than that. That's just beautiful. And the backgrounds are blurry because of the long telephoto lens. It's just fantastic. Brewing owls, I'm kind of ending up here. I got a few more, but uh, I just, I love owls myself and I've always enjoyed uh, photographing them. These are young owls just coming out of their little den, uh, waiting for mom to bring breakfast. <laughs> it's pretty cool. And here they are in the middle of the day. Definitely the lighting changes, the color changes. There's a lot of interest with this little group of huddled little owls together, okay? Puffins, um, they are fantastic as well. Um, this is from a blind, okay? So I was concealed. I wasn't, uh, you know, they didn't see me as much. They just saw what looked to be a lens sticking out of this blind. They didn't pay much attention. But look at the background. It's just so clean and blue and so sharp against their... Uh, faces in their white uh, feathers. See a big difference between those two photographs. I think the previous one is a lot better. You can see the uh, the birds better behind a blue or non-distracting background. Okay. And here's one. Of, here's my last one of uh, a peacock. And peacocks are so beautiful and so magnificent. This one is at a zoo at the San Diego Zoo. And uh, when I saw this. It was just like, oh my gosh, I've got to get that uh, photograph. It's just beautiful. And these types of photographs are used to sell colors. So things from TVs to um, all sorts of things. So a peacock is representative of beautiful color. So make sure you get as much of the color of the the, the blue and, and their tail feathers are just beautiful. So anyway, um, I'm going to transfer over now. I realize I'm uh, talking a lot. I gave you, a, there was a hundred images there, but I want to give you images that I've done well with. So you can begin to say, I, I want to encourage you is what I'm saying is it's a, it's a awesome hob. It's an awesome profession and that I'm blessed to, to have as a wildlife photographer uh, for over 25 years now. But I'm now going to transition to it, some advice for you that are looking to be a wildlife photographer, okay? it's It can take a long time just because of the nature of places you're going to travel and things like that. So it gets down to some expense, okay? Obviously. You got expense of the equipment, which is not uh, cheap. And I, I don't ever get cheap equipment. I buy the best. Um, I use, I've used Canon and Nikon, and even way back in the day, uh, Olympus cameras. So I currently use Canon cameras. They are fabulous, but Canon, Nikon, uh, Minolta, you know, it's really not the camera that takes the picture, it's you. Okay. So, Good technique, good uh, choice of lenses, backgrounds, all those elements takes takes time to learn. But hopefully you saw some of the photographs I've taken and it's encouraging to say, you know what, I just want to do that. I love wildlife. I, I want to photograph that. And so that's, I was hopefully being encouraging. Now, 
to address the challenge of cost. Okay, I have an, I have a solution, and I don't want to distract you with from your passion, but I know the road you're on is challenging. You're gonna have to, you know, the equipment, the travel, just you know, all this stuff. It's expensive, but it's it's a problem that can be solved. And what I the reason why I'm doing this video is because I, I want to help people and uh, help those that are looking to you know be wildlife photographers, okay? So what I want to share now is the solution because I, you know, the internet was not around in the 80s when I started, okay? So today what I have is a way to uh, earn a secondary income stream, okay? A secondary income stream is so smart okay so yes I don't want you to uh, be distracted too much from your photography but I I also realize that it's expensive and so what I um, help people really with now is helping them to uh, leverage themselves which means how to uh, take advantage of the internet to create the freedom and lifestyle to do what Ever you would like to do okay so what I my strong recommendation is is build a side income a secondary income and what I'm showing you is just a uh, an information page that I have now this might change a little bit uh, as I record this here in February of 2015 but what I'm offering you is a chance to learn what I'm doing and a chance to be exposed to a way to to have a secondary income and uh, you know build it over time but not take forever to do it and not uh, you know confuse you or or uh, sidetrack you from your photography as well this is something that can run on autopilot when you set some things up and it will generate income for you so that's just a quick view of the page my suggestion and, and a little bit more about what i do specifically is i get paid when people shop at uh, apple when they shop at best buy and walmart's and literally thousands of other stores so it's a very novel unique uh business that's a side income Okay, that's the thing. I want you to understand it's a secondary income that will help you afford the equipment, the education. And I went to uh, Brooks Institute for three years to perfect and hone my photography skills. So I know the expenses you are looking at. And I, I want to encourage you, but also be realistic to help you along so that if you have this secondary income stream, you can afford, not overnight, it's not overnight, but you can begin to afford the education, the equipment, be able to travel, to be able to, to, be able to photograph wildlife, which is what you want, which is what I want. And so now I'm, I'm much more able to do the things that I like doing, which is photographing wildlife. So it is a profession for me. It could be a, a very serious hobby for you, but what a great way to have a, a way to make money online that doesn't take all the time, suck the life out of you, <laughs> like a job can do while you're trying to get ahead as a photographer. You know, with a job, you're just, it's so much hours and so much time. So I appreciate you hanging in there, watching this video on how to be a wildlife photographer. I've shared, honestly, my experiences. Obviously, you saw that my expertise but i did not have the internet like you do right now you have an advantage that i did not have you can shorten the the, the learning curve you can shorten uh, your success and you can actually do more when you have a secondary income coming in from the internet so i invite you to check that out it may not be exactly what you're looking for that's fine check it out get the information you can go to the website when with chase.com win with chase.com you'll find a link uh, in the description of this video
You'll find a link possibly on a button right below this video. Whatever you uh, decide on, though, um, I'm just here to help. Uh, I'm here to present the idea that the Internet can really help you pursue your dream to be a wildlife photographer. And I'm here to help. If you have questions or comments, please add those below. Uh, look for more videos down the road uh, because I, I like sharing my experience and want to help others. So thanks for hanging out for this uh, video, this hangout, and uh, we'll hopefully talk in the near future about your desire on how to be a wildlife photographer and how to make that really happen. Thanks for watching. Have a great day. Bye for now.